Um, I'm going to start the presentation, and then Chris Bumcrot is going to give you some more details about some of our research findings. I'm going to start with wh why we did this, how we developed um, the study, which combines actually three surveys, talk a little bit about how we structured the survey, um, and then I'm going to turn it over, as I said to Chris, to give you some of the results. Then I'm going to come back and talk about how we're trying to disseminate the survey um, and get it out to people to use it. Um, one of the reasons that we, we decided to engage in the survey is that, you know, Treasury and the President's um, um, Advisory Council on Financial Literacy was very interested in, in figuring out what was going on with individual Americans with respect to their financial decision making. Um, obviously, I think all of you know that we have entered a period of rapid change in the financial industry from two aspects. First of all, there has been a rapid shift in people having to take more responsibility for financial decision making in this country. And two, products are becoming much more complex um, and that's accelerating. Um, so how are people able to make financial decisions um, with respect to those things? So our goal with this first study was to establish a baseline of financial capability for U.S. adults. Um, Financial capability doesn't just measure knowledge. Um, there are many uh, um, surveys out there that simply measure, measure financial literacy or financial knowledge. What we wanted to do is look at other aspects of finance, which is looking at some of the behavioral aspects of, of finance and figuring out how those impact the decision making of investors. We had a um, terrific team um, that we put together um, to work on this project. Um, and we worked with Anna Lusardi, who was terrific in working with us. As Bob said, Bob was a terrific, gave us a lot of terrific insight in how to build the survey instrument. That's primarily where we spent most of the time in developing um, this program. But we had a lot of input from a lot of people um, to develop the financial capability study. We did not start with a blank slate. Um, we, as you know, Michael Barr was asked the question, do we look outside the United States for examples of how things are done um, with respect to financial education? What we did is we actually looked at the studies that were done in the United Kingdom on financial capability in Ireland um, and used those as a basis um, for developing the financial capability study in the United States. Um, so for anyone who looks at the UK or the Irish studies that have been done, you will see many similarities between those studies and the study that, that we just did in 2009. Uh, there are three components or three linked studies, um, here, surveys here. Um, the first is a national survey um, with about 1,400 plus um, respondents to that. Um, there's a state-by-state -state survey of over 20, 28,000 respondents. Um, that allows us to do state-by-state -state analysis. Um, with respect to the data that we did. And then finally, we did a military survey of about 800 respondents. Now, I think for all of you, it makes pretty, pretty good sense why we did a national and state-by-state survey. Um, the reason we did a military survey is the military audience is a very important audience to the FINRA Foundation. Um, we work very closely with the Department of Defense and their financial readiness program um, to work with them. And that, because of that, we wanted to sample and survey that audience. Um, I think one thing for researchers that they may want to consider is the interesting thing about the military is it's a pretty homogeneous audience. Plus, um, the military has been working um, in the workplace to develop a fairly uh, robust financial education program for some time. And I think as, as Chris gives you some of the results, um, you'll see that in some areas, the military appears to be much more financially capable than the U.S. civilian population. Now, there are four key components um, to the survey, um, making ends meet, planning ahead, managing financial products, and financial knowledge and decision making. And this very closely mirrors what the UK did with their financial capability study. Making ends meet, I mean, although people have different incomes um, and different needs, everyone needs to make sure that their spending does not consistently exceed um, their income. So it's, it's clearly fundamental to financial capability that people are not spending more than they have. And that's what making ends meet goes to, and we asked several questions in that area. Um, just as important is planning ahead. Are people planning for their financial futures? Do they have an emergency fund? Do they, are they thinking about how much they need to save for retirement? Are they saving for their college, their children's college education? 
Um, managing financial products was another key area that we looked at. Making informed decisions about financial products is an important aspect of financial capability. Are they making choices with respect to products? Or are they making good decisions about a variety of products from um, banking or, or to non-bank borrowing, um, to credit cards, to auto loans, um, to retirement savings and investment products. And then finally, we did look at financial knowledge and decision making. We asked a battery of questions, which I'll talk about in just a minute um, to go through that. And then we also looked at comparison shopping. Are people you know, comparing products um, to make sure that they are getting the best product they have? So now I'm going to turn it over to Chris Bumcrot, um, who is the head of Applied Research and Consulting, who's going to go through mm -hmm. some of the results with you. So uh, John and I adopted a slightly different strategy here in terms of showing some, uh, some results. We're just going to show you a couple little slivers of data, hopefully whet your appetite and get you to uh, spend some time at uh, the Finner Foundation's website and do a little digging of your own. Uh, so I'm not going to be showing you a whole list of the items that are in the survey. I'm just going to pick out a couple to illustrate some of the findings and some of the ways that, that they can be broken down, uh, either demographically or geographically or, or across different populations. The, uh, the first point that I want to illustrate has to do with making ends meet. So as John said, there were a number of questions designed to get at the sense of our uh, are, are the individuals in our survey having trouble or having ease making ends meet? Uh, the simplest question we asked turned out to be, I think, one of the most interesting, which was we, we just asked them simply, are you spending le last year? Did you spend less than your income? Did you spend about equal to your income? Or did you spend more than your income? So we gave them three simple choices. We explained that we didn't mean to include uh, items like purchasing a home or a car if they were financing it with, with debt. But you can see here that aggregating across the entire uh, the larger data set we had, the state-by-state -state data set, uh, you end up with fewer than half, only 42% who said that they are actually putting anything away, that they are actually spending less than their income. So it's a minority of the overall U.S. population who even on a self-reporting basis says that they are actively saving. Uh, in the middle, you have the roughly a third of the respondents who essentially, I guess you could say, are living from paycheck to paycheck. They're not falling behind, but they're not able to put anything away from, from their earnings. And then finally, you have the 20% who reported that they are, in fact, spending more than their income. They are falling deeper into a hole. So quite a, quite a high percentage of American adults who say that they, are, uh, that they are not, that they're failing to make ends meet. Just again to illustrate here, one of the ways that the data can be, uh, can be looked at, we have a chart that shows the extremes uh, across the 50 states. Actually, we had 50 states plus the District of, Col of Columbia. We have a, uh, a sample drawn from an online panel, uh, 500 respondents roughly from all 50 states plus DC. Uh, each of those states, then the data set was weighted to represent the population of that state in terms of age and gender and uh, education and ethnicity. And here are the two extremes. So you see the mean across the U.S. again, 42% of Americans overall said that they are spending less than their income. In New Jersey, you have the highest percentage uh, across all the 51 states, uh, nearly half who say that they are in fact able to, to save. And then Montana was at the other extreme. Uh, now, New Jersey and Montana weren't uh, extreme outliers. It was, a, it was a bell curve, roughly speaking. So there are a few other states that are really close to, to both ends of the spectrum. But it's quite a wide variety, I think you'll agree. I mean, all the way from about a half to less than a third. Uh, some of that is probably due to underlying demographic differences. I don't think we can attribute it specifically to geography, obviously. Uh, but one of the things that we're hoping we're going to be able to encourage the people in this room to think about is uh, to delve into the data on their own. We're going to be making the full data set available uh, sometime in December, and we would encourage researchers to work with us, to work on their own, to take a look and see if, uh, if, if you can tease apart what are really the underlying factors, whether they're demographic, geographic, attitudinal, uh, or, or literacy, financial literacy oriented, what are the, the drivers that really matter and that maybe could be operated on in terms of policy levers uh, to affect financial capability. Let's take a look at one of the questions that we asked regarding planning ahead. And again, as John said, we had a few different questions. 
that tried to get at people's planning. We asked some questions about retirement planning. We asked questions about putting money away for children's education. Uh, but one fairly simple question we asked is, have you put aside enough funds, rainy day funds, to pay your expenses for three months in the case of an emergency? And as the pie chart shows here, across the, across the country, uh, just over one third said that they've done that. Uh, a couple weren't quite sure. Uh, now, that might be because they leave that sort of decision making up to their spouse, but I think it also could be just people who are like, well, mm, I do have some money put aside. I've never really thought about whether that's enough for three months or not. Uh, but in any event, we're left with 60% who flatly admit that no, they, they don't even have the resources to deal with, a, with an emergency that would, uh, that would, that would stop them from, from earning income for 60%. Uh, here's a case where we thought it might be interesting to look at the contrast between our civilian population and the military population that were asked the same questions. Uh, now, this is not an apples to apples comparison for a whole host of reasons. One of them being that the, the military, the demographics of the military population are, uh, are con more homogeneous, as John said, than the demographics of the entire US population, particularly in terms of age. They do skew younger. Uh, they are much less likely to have non-high school graduates. Virtually no unbanked are in the military. Uh, but still, the contrast here is pretty stark. So whereas only 35% of the civilians said that they were prepared for 90 days, 50% of the military said that they had funds put aside and they were prepared. Now, I don't know, maybe that's a, uh, it, it, there could be psychological factors. Maybe these are people, people who are in the military are a little bit more oriented towards thinking about self-protection and being prepared. Um, it could also be that you know, they're people who do have a steady paycheck, and so they've had the opportunity to put money aside. What's interesting, though, is I don't have the chart to show you here, but we had uh, another finding from the military survey that showed that the military respondents were more likely to be carrying high levels of debt than civilian respondents, even relative to their income. So there's more research to be done on this, but it does appear that uh, that military personnel, and starting at a fairly young point in their careers, they are susceptible to and probably are preyed upon, uh, and, and they are likely to fall more into debt early on and carry a, a pretty heavy debt load. So it's conceivable that the way they're managing their balance sheets is they're keeping sufficient liquidity to manage the, a potential emergency, but in the long run, they have some liabilities that are gonna present challenges to them. A, uh, a third area John mentioned was the idea of managing financial products. And we have a whole range of questions in terms of how people use credit cards, how people use mortgages. But we also wanted to drill down specifically into the subject of, uh, of, of non-bank borrowing methods, which often uh, end up being much more expensive for the borrower uh, and, and frequently unbanked, uh, unbanked people will turn to non-bank borrowing methods and it'll end up being a lot more uh, expensive for them than traditional methods. We asked about five different non-bank borrowing methods from pawn shops all the way to refund anticipation loans. And again, this is the civilian population. Uh, you can see that for each of these five methods, only a pretty small percentage said that they'd engaged in, in one of them over the past five years. And that, that's how the question was asked, over the past five years. So the one that was most commonly cited was a pawn shop. 12% of adults said they'd used a pawn shop at some time in the past five years, but only 6% had used a uh, refund anticipation loan. Uh, but if you roll this up across uh, the variety of borrowing methods uh, to see how many or what percentage of, of, of people have used at least one of these methods over the last five years, then you get to about a quarter. 24% of adults say, I've used at least one of these over the last five years. Uh, again, there's a lot of variety here, and one way to illustrate that, here I'll just show an age breakdown. Uh, and the age breakdown shows you that the young people in our survey were a lot more likely to say they'd done this in the past five years. Uh, the 55 plus were quite unlikely to have engaged in any of these non-bank borrowing methods uh, for a whole host of reasons, I'm sure. Uh, again, though, my real point in showing this chart is just to suggest to all of you in the room that there's the opportunity in this data set to take a look at any number of our key measures across a wide variety of standard demographics. Uh, and, I, and I do think, again, there's a lot of work that could be done tying together the attitudes to the behaviors to the demographic, underlying demographic factors, uh, and, and, and surfacing a lot of interesting patterns. 
We have a couple more charts. I'm going to ask John to, to take over to go on to the next ones here uh, to, uh, to, to get into the details of some of the financial literacy questions that we asked. Uh, I'll move very quickly through, through this slide. Um, the last area that we asked was on financial knowledge. Um, and what we did is we asked a bar battery of questions, of five questions, very simple questions with respect to interest rates, mortgages, did people understand the difference between a 15 and a 30 year mortgage, um, inflation, um, a risk question, and, and a bond price question. And, and as you can see, in many instances, people got um, many of these questions right. But I think just to highlight one, which is the bond price question, which was just to understand, did they understand the difference between how bond prices react to interest rate environment? I think that's a key question right now, given that we have a low interest rate environment right now. What's going to happen if that interest rate is going to go up? Bond prices are going to go down, and I think that's going to be a surprise to the large number of people who are now in bonds and bond funds. Um, so I'm just going that, to skip over this slide and move to how we're rolling out the data. Um, already we have the data uh, for the National Telephone, Telephone Survey available on our website, FinraFoundation.org. You can also find the executive summary um, at our booth out front. The military online survey is already available. There's an executive summary for that out there. All the data sets for both the, the national and the military um, samples are available on our website. Um, we will be launching the state-by-state online survey results um, hopefully within the next two to three weeks um, and at the same time we will be making available the data set for the state by state. We are developing an interactive website for the state by state data so that people can compare one state against the national averages or one state against another state or a state against a region um, with respect to a battery of questions. Um, so hopefully that will make that information very accessible to a lot of different people. We'll also have outliers. Some states did better than others with respect to some of these questions, and that information will be available too. Thank you.